You're listening to the Tumbling Saber Podcast, a member of the Star Wars Commonwealth Podcast Network. Check us out on the web at StarWarsCommonwealth.com, on iTunes, Facebook, and Twitter, and take your first step into a larger world. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to episode 52 of the Tumbling Saber podcast, where it is Sunday night. It is about half an hour until Rogue One tickets go on sale. And we're sitting here on pins and needles. I'm, I'm ready. And uh, we're, we're going to snap those up in, show, in the show. You might actually hear us buying Rogue One tickets, which will be a thrill for you, I'm sure. But we've got an actual really packed show full of Rogue One stuff, as you might imagine. So let's get right to it. Corey, how you doing? Not too bad, not too bad. I moved over the weekend, so I uh, feel kind of crippled a bit. You old. Yup, yup. I didn't even feel that bad when I moved into this house, and that was only a couple years ago, and I'm older than you. I did it. Shape I, up, buddy. Dude, I, I pretty much did everything all by myself in the snow. It snowed both days. I decided to move, and yeah. You had movers! I had Who'd them, you tip 80 bucks? I had them do... <laughs> Only the large things, because I needed someone else, and I didn't want to ask anyone this time. And anyway, yeah, like, but everything else, like, I literally phew, can't tell you how many times I walked up and down the stairs. Literally, ah, come on, box Shape up, by buddy. box. I'm telling you, it hurts. I did three days of car trips with boxes when we moved into this house. Dude, I used to work Sorry, on a not, moving not, truck not, and move, move three houses a day. Yeah, and then you got old. Yeah, you're right. You, you let it happen. You let it happen. You're supposed to do like Martin Riggs and just will it not to happen. I do. I do. And James, how you doing? Uh, I'm doing terrific. You actually gave me chills, shivers, excitement when you said we were buying tickets tonight. I got that. I haven't had that feeling since uh, the Hobbit tickets went on sale. I didn't, I didn't <laughs> really have that tingly feeling for The Force Awakens so much as, as I just did now when I know we're having our big adventure night. Yeah, I was, yeah I was, it's going to be a good night. It was. That's. I, I, I put it out there now. I, I said I'm buying Rogue One tickets. If it falls flat, it's. This is, I'm going to feel terrible. Yeah, you, I, I think we should officially invite um, Carlos out to to the Rogue One uh, sh- show tonight on this show. Uh, we'll probably do it again if we if we uh, get around to remembering on Sith Disturbers. But we should invite him out now when this goes out on Monday. Yeah, I mean, if if he wasn't already aware that he's invited, Carlos, uh, we hereby uh, uh, open the doors. To join, to join us for a, for for a nice pre-game meal, or pre-Rogue One meal, or what have you, on uh, I guess that would be Thursday the fifteenth. We await your response, sir. Please RSVP by contacting uh, uh any one of us. You know where to find us. Okay, a lot of Star Wars stuff to talk about, guys. Um, uh, first, a sad farewell to Australian actor Peter Sumner. Now, he passed away earlier this week at the age of 74, uh, which which feels almost like a young now. I don't know if that's just because of the, the age we live in, where life expectancy it seems to be much, so much better and you can live a vibrant life well into your 70s and 80s. Um, or if it's just because, you know, we, we have family. Our parents are starting to flirt with those numbers and we, maybe we don't want to accept that. But uh, Peter Sumner, you might know him better as... Uh, the Imperial officer who uttered the words, TK-421, why aren't you at your post? We all remember that guy. Of course. Yeah, one of Han Solo's best scenes, no? <laughs> um, among, well, in that area where they first uh, invade the Death Star. It's right, it's right <laughs> after Luke, Luke and Han steal the uh, Stormtrooper equipment. It's classic. So he, he passed away this, this week. Uh, which is sad. I mean, it's, it's one of those, again, one of these background characters who got one line but will forever live in infamy for Star Wars fans. It's crazy. Yeah, it's funny. One, thing, one line makes you famous if you're in a movie franchise as big as Star Wars. That's all it takes. I mean, and the guy went on to have a good career. So I, I don't want to say he was just a one-hit wonder. 
Uh, but you know, I, I was looking at the the picture of the guy, and he was 34 at the time he filmed his brief scene in in A New Hope. Corey. <laughs> <laughs> 34 years old and i looked at him like 34 is that really what passes for 34 then and i thought i thought about my old collection of 80s era 70s era baseball and hockey cards when you look at those guys 20 looks like 40 yeah it's unbelievable it's unbelievable i don't know if it's the sideburns or if just everybody smoked four packs a day then but a lot of it's perspective too a lot of it's the eyes you saw you see it through. I guess. But when you when you look at hockey cards today and you see 21-year-olds, they look like babies. When you look at 21 21-year-olds from that era, they look like grizzled old men. Like what was going on <laughs> in the 70s and 80s? Even before that, cocaine. Well, there's definitely some sort of pivot, I would say in the 70s cuz when you when you go back further and look at guys who were in the 50s and 60s, when you look at them at 20, 21 years old, uh, they looked their age, more or less. Yeah, you're right. Baby-faced. I, me- I remember seeing a picture of uh, of the Rocket um, in his f- a high school picture. Like, I don't know if it was a high school graduation picture, but a high school picture. And he looked like a baby-faced 16-year-old when he was 16. Because he was such a chiseled man when, when he was a man. Like, at 30, yeah, he, he looked he like, had, like the, the... stone. The matinee movie star good looks. Absolutely. That that look in his eye. But de- definitely, if, if you have an old set of sports cards, specifically dating to the, I would say, no later than early 90s, and specifically in the 80s and 70s, check those out. Find a guy who looks particularly beat up, flip it over, and see how old he is. And I, I there'll be a bunch of times when you, when you look at him and go, what? This guy's 25. <laughs> he looks like my grandfather. It's unbelievable. I don't. I don't. Uh, fitness and nutrition has for sure something to do with it. it haircuts and side, sideburns and mustaches make you look old. Yeah. They. Uh, yeah. And my my. I have a set of nineteen eighty three baseball cards, and it's got to be two thirds of people with with mustaches. Dude, quick sidebar: at my banquet before I shaved off the uh, the nine inch beard. A, a peripheral girl who didn't know me at all t- told my friend that she was shocked to see what I look like after the shave because she thought I was 70. <laughs> 70. <laughs> 70. Dude. How do you take that? Is that like, wow, wow. I, I, I just laughed. I just, what are you going to? She must, 70. like, I'm not, I'm not tooting my own horn when I say this. She must have thought I was the most epic, athletic seventy-year-old in the league. Well, yeah. Like, you should even have... if I'm not a great forty-year-old, which which I'm decent. Like I've, I'm pretty athletic. I make diving catches and stuff still, or I dive for the ball at any rate. But like, if she thought I was seventy, <laughs> dude, you should have wow. went with it. You should have went with it after, even after you shaved the beard. You should have been like, well, I'm actually only like sixty-eight, but I'm getting there. <laughs> <laughs> I all I could do was laugh. Wow, dude. Okay, so rest in peace, Peter Sumner. Uh, so okay, so this week Anthony Bresnikin was added again. He is just when when it comes to time uh, for, for Star Wars movies to drop, specifically in the, in the last calendar year, he has been all over these movies. He, he basically is. Almost, I don't know if he's embedded in Lucasfilm, but he's got the scoop on everything. He's definitely the guy when it comes to following what's going on with Star Wars. And this week is no exception, as as EU Entertainment Weekly released their their big Star Wars issue this week, and it was day after day of stupendous content from Anthony Bresnik. And so, uh, from me to him, a big thank you for for all his hard work. And uh, I, I guess we'll. We'll, we'll try and sum up a lot of what came out of uh, Entertainment Weekly. And it's going to be, there's a lot, so we'll, we'll do our best here. But um, one of the questions being kicked around at Lucasfilm is what to do post episode nine. And so Kathleen Kennedy said, uh, that's a conversation going on right now, too. I have to honestly tell you, 
Could we do nothing but standalones? Sure, but I don't know. We're looking at all of that. So the first thing I, I, I want to kick around here, do you think they're going to do nothing but standalones? Or are, are they going to pull the plug on the episode Sodic movies? I feel like they've already said they're doing episode 10, and I couldn't find the quote, so maybe they didn't. But uh, James, what do you think? Is, is this is this the future of, of Star Wars? Standalones? Yes. Uh, I thought a lot about it. I, I thought... So you linked, you, like I, I mentioned off air, um, you've got the show up, show notes up early. Um, and so we get to outline this stuff days in advance. And, and reading through it, I, I started thinking, and I, I thought uh, a week ago that I wanted the saga to go on for a very long time. And I've redetermined or rediscovered that I, I, I'm ready for an end. And standalones just means there's another way to look at it. Can you tell the Skywalker story forever? And if you look at it that way, the answer is no. At some point, the Skywalker story wraps up. And so you can tell the story of the GFFA forever. And, and the saga ends with the, the Skywalker story and, and the galaxy goes on. So if, if you don't use words like saga and standalones, but just, you know, the idea that some stories have to arc, then, I don't know, nine might be enough. If, if it's not nine, it's 12, but then I'm ready to be done. Hmm. Corey, do you have any, any thoughts on that? Yeah, definitely. Like, I think everything that was written in this article was really, uh, especially everything Kathleen Kennedy said, like, I have the exact same quote copy pasted right in front of me which says, I honestly have to tell you. But she, she says, sure, but I don't know. We're looking at all of that. So, like, I do think that there still will be a 10, 11, 12. But, I mean, yeah, like, it looks, it just seems like they're looking at all possible angles. And it, the thing goes on to basically say in the end that, you know, she, once Rogue One comes out, they're going to have to, they're going to sit down and they're going to go over everything and where they need to be. But it wouldn't surprise me if they did put some kind of saga back in the vault. And I'm with James. I've always said this. I want an end to the, the Skywalker saga at one point. I don't want to be watching Star Wars 26 or whatever it is. Like, <laughs> you know, like I think 12 is a, a good number. Even, you know, even 10 could be good or nine. Sorry. Like, I'd be happy yeah, at nine. It's funny, so Corey, you know what? Ten could be good. You accidentally might have stumbled onto something. Why Why do another trilogy? Maybe they, maybe they do this trilogy and then a finale. No one's ever said that before, I don't think. That's true. No, that's, that's, I've never heard that uttered. Because we know, like, like, look at the time period. Like, um, it's a hundred years in the, like, if... If we take the wills of the force thing with R2, like, I want to believe in that part of it all. So, like, we're encroaching on that 100-year time span, I would think, no? We, we've we gone pretty far at this point. Episode 10 could could nicely wrap up that that 100-year time span. I like that yeah, idea. We're, I mean, we're let's like, that, like year Let's throw that out there so. into, the tw into the Twitterverse slash social mediaverse. Let's get somebody to buy into that. I think t 10 episodes is a nice... I don't know. Imagine a one, like after a trilogy, imagine you found out there was just a one coming of something called a finale. Yeah, X. It would be the number X, too. It'd be so cool. Star Wars Episode X, like the wrap up. Yeah. For now. And, until they inevitably decide to start it up again. Well, they would. Well, no, and they... what's beautiful about that is when, <laughs> when you're doing one off stories down the road, like so, so then after we get, you know, Han and, and, and Boba Fett and all the stuff that, you know, uh, uh, Obi Wan. And then they go back and, and they revisit, they do Luke's story. It's not even part of the the saga, but you get more Skywalker because they do his exile and I, I, and some cool related, you know? I would think in our lifetime too that they can create another saga. There's eons and eons of Force users and stuff. Like, you think this is the first time the, the galaxies come under peril, kind of, you know? Like, there's there's plenty of fodder for them to, to go after and... That's what basically what they're saying too is that, you know, we're gonna take a step back and see what we need to do and 
it's good. We've talked about it in the past. Like, I want them to put stuff in the vault. Like, put it away, rehash it again. Like, who knows? Maybe we'll see Ray and Finn in like thirty years. You know? Yeah, maybe. Like, it sounds like they're definitely considering all options, and it sounds definitely like uh, how we embrace or how the the public embraces Rogue One will will play a role for sure, and and which roadmap they follow right now. I, I feel like they wouldn't pull. I mean, obviously we're getting episodes eight and nine. There's, there's no question there. And I, I would eat my tumbling saber shirt, which is available at tpublic.com. Uh, if they didn't do, <laughs> <laughs> you saw the two killer designs I put out there this week. I did see, uh, both are excellent. They're, it, and they're perfect for this time of year because it's coming into the, <laughs> No, it's true. It's coming into the crappy time and people don't want to be thinking about winter. So both are excellent summer shirts. Christmas is coming. For the t-shirt lover on your list, these will get noticed. Yeah, and uh, James, you actually, you, insp- you directly inspired uh, the Sunglasses the Hut. Love it. I had some fun with that one. Uh, anyway, a little cool sidebar there. So I'll, I'll eat my shirt if they don't do episodes 10, 11, 12. I'd be stunned. Like as long as these movies pull in, like I mean, Force Awakens is probably probably an, an anomaly, in that it grossed two billion dollars globally. But even if Episode Eight gets close, one point five billion, as long as these movies rake in that kind of scratch, I can't see them pulling the plug on that. Yeah, but you had said it in the past. Like I, I could see twelve, uh, twelve being the limit, kind of almost for me. Like. Would you really want to see 13, 14, 15? You know what I mean? I mean ultimately, it depends on the story. There's some that... factors you're not considering, too, though. The, oh, I'm sure there's, there's Number tons. crunchers. Well, no, well, yeah, of course. But something, something that I think is, is a major player is the idea that the number crunchers know if they can put out a Rogue One movie with – you know, two years hype on a one-off, and it makes say it makes I don't know what what what, what does a hundred and twenty-five million dollar opening weekend forecast for for overall take, Kyle? You you know this stuff better than me. If it makes a hundred and twenty-five million like opening weekend, that that means what? You're, it'll, you're it'll coming close what? to like a billion, like nine hundred. Um, no, well, I I think mathematically, if it, just for your typical movie, that would usually map out to more of a you know, half billion, six hundred, five hundred, yeah, uh, five hundred million, six hundred million. But I think because uh, because it's, it's Star Wars, it always has sort of that extra Star Wars bump to it. I th- I think people are, are thinking this is going to kind of just do half of what The Force Awakens did, which would put it in the one billion dollar range globally. So let's play conservative and say seven, you know, seven or eight, seven fifty. If that's the case, and you can do that on two years build, there's got to be someone chirping in um, decision makers' ears that the reason The Force Awakens, the reason the prequels, the reason these movies break break records is huge weights, yeah, huge exactly. lulls, huge deca- build decades up in anticipation, of, of anticipation. Yeah. And so, if you you can't, the saga won't continue to do that if if you keep putting out. 10, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. It won't do no, that. No, you're right. So if the one-offs make 750, that's green light to just keep doing one-offs every year. Yeah, I yeah think. somebody would have to make the case that these are more, uh, the standalones are more cost-effective, they're more profitable, on and on and on. That That's, I, I hate being, I hate saying, I hate coming from that business-driven perspective, but I think that's ultimately, you know, where they draw the line. It has to be when, when a movie that we love costs hundreds of millions to make, then unfortunately artistic integrity isn't the only concern and probably not even number one. So yeah, yeah, definitely that's going to be a driving decision. Well, factor. I have to say this, like I've said it from the beginning, whatever Kathleen Kennedy said in this, in this article was just, you know, they're all about the Star Wars. They want to do it right, man. They want to do right by it, even though like they know they're still gonna make. They've already recouped their investment and made profit already. So, well, yeah, I'll say, but I'll say this to that core. They want to do right, 
because you know doing right keeps people happy and brings dollars in. But what she says to to the people who wrote that article is what she's trying to say to the public. But when she's making decisions, she's definitely thinking shareholders first, not fans. Yeah, but absolutely. What that, all a big part of that when they sit down in January, like she said, like they're gonna take a seat back and see where they need to steer this thing. I don't, you know, we're talking about this. And obviously, they're going to be having that exact same conversation. About... I think their conversation is much different. It is, but there were the the fact that they putting Star Wars on ice for a bit. They will definitely be talking about that, and it will be. It won't surprise me if it goes on ice for quite some like the saga. Anyhow, like keep going with the stand uh, standalones, but the saga will. Like, I could see them taking a. F- at least a five, ten year lull, and maybe even creating a new one. I like ten. I like ten. Uh, I'll, I'll, hark, I'll I'll go back to uh, what Kyle said earlier. Um, I, I think it's really going to depend a lot on what Rogue One does. A lot. Well, if Rogue One that does exceptionally well, is that the green light to to vault the episodic stuff, or or at least consider that more strongly because you know you can bank and rely on standalones or if, if rogue one kind of does middling numbers which are still spectacular will still be eye-popping is that kind of a thing where uh you know what if we really want to squeeze this star wars lemon you know we, we need these 1.5 2 billion dollar tent poles you know i think they i think they're they're disney for a reason and, and the brilliance of their plan is that their hamster this, this Rogue One movie, isn't anybody's flagship. They get to test the waters with a story that's really a, you know a, a unknown. So if it does well, imagine what Han's story will do. Imagine what Fett's story will do. You know, like they, they can only, it's only easier for them to sell it to, to the people who need to pony up dollars in the future. So they've really set them, and if it doesn't do well, Nah, they can go, well, this isn't Han's story. This isn't Fett's story. So, you know, you can still pony up the money because that's a, a more sure bet. It, it, it's almost a win-win for them in a way. <laughs> With the amount of money they're raking in, it's, yeah. They are just doubled over with money and pleasure right now. They're so happy about this acquisition. But James, you you mentioned Boba Fett. You, you whispered his name. And apparently they, we were really close to actually seeing a teaser trailer for the Boba Fett movie. Now, I don't think they actually shot anything. So recall last year we saw, or two years ago, we saw a quick little thing for Rogue One, and it was just a TIE fighter flying along this this junkyard landscape with, with the Death Star kind of in, in the, the over the horizon. I think it was probably something like that, which required no casting, no cameras, no shooting. But uh, Josh Trank, uh, unfortunately, the guy known for the, uh, the the Fantastic Four reboot from this year, or la- was it last year? No, Josh Trank is known for having the worst last name. <laughs> uh, but you know what? Uh, I, I I don't care. I don't I don't need a Boba Fett movie. I'm glad this thing was sort of turfed. I'm gl- I'm not glad, but uh, the sequence of events that befell Josh Trank and his Fantastic Four reboot. If that's what caused the fallout for the Boba Fett movie, thank God, because I I do not need to see a Boba Fett movie. It's so true, Kyle. Like Hollywood, I'm sure it works like that. Like it's like sorry, but like Star Wars cannot be associated with this now. Like you have to resign. Sorry, you know, like it's in your contract already. Well, I, I don't know. Do you guys feel? Go ahead, James. S- sorry. Well, do you guys feel that that Boba Fett has become um, hipsterized? And what I mean is, like, it was cool to like Boba Fett when, like, no one knew who he was. But now it's cool to hate Boba Fett because everyone likes him. Yeah, I I have a bit of a grudge against him. Like, that's why he wasn't in uh, in the last poll or the poll that uh, we ran last week. But uh, that's... I, I don't I feel like hate the, Boba the, Fett. The, the, sort just... of the, the fan love for Boba Fett is sort of like shifted. It used to be like cool to like him, and now it's almost like not cool to like him. Yeah, he's like, he's like well, he's like like the Johnny Cash of Star Wars. Bah. Like every... <laughs> <laughs> I 
where like he, he's he's just that's that's Corey's rancor impersonation. Ah. <laughs> well, he's he was just like the coolest guy that nobody really knew anything about, and then he had, like Johnny Cash exploded about ten years ago. And I don't think anybody hates Johnny Cash, but there was sort of like an overexposure. You know, Ring of Fire was everywhere you went. You could hear his, his stuff everywhere. And then suddenly everybody was a Johnny Cash fan. You know what? The prequels, I think the prequels lent, lent to, 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 towards that shift because he was like this like sort of cool side character and then his story became really important. Yeah, like I feel like you didn't need Boba Fett at all. Like I, I get that he's now... He's essentially a, a clone, an unaltered clone. Dude, that, it's But he's all, right now at the center of that. It's all marketing schemes. Like, honestly, like, I got to ask you, I was thinking about this earlier today. Do you think that when, you know, back in the day, we, I, me, you and I, Kyle, had discussed, we knew the lore to what kind of happened, like, the, in the prequels, like, when we were, like, probably, like, I don't know, 10 years before it came out, we always knew that there was... George Lucas had envisioned some kind of like lava battle and there was a clone war, but never had I envisioned that, you know, Boba Fett's dad would be like the clone army. Like that, that is a play on, because Boba Fett was so popular. It's like, let's rewrite him in and make him even more significant to the saga. You know what I mean? Like he was just a bounty hunter. But it's like no marketing he, he, he people. He was a guy like, in a cool suit. Yeah, but the marketing people were like, "No, we gotta, we gotta do something about this." Like, well, I, I think it was all George Lucas. I don't think there's any marketing people involved. I think the prequels are lock, stock George Lucas. It's it's everything he wanted to do, he did. Yeah, there but was nobody I, to tell him otherwise. I don't think that he had originally vi- envisioned that for Boba Fett. I think it was just basically because of his popularity, he said, "Hey, let's make his character even more significant." Oh, yeah, I'm, I think George Lucas could come to that conclusion on his own. And maybe I'm wrong. There there are p- people out there who know the history more than I do, but... I just never thought the Clone Wars would be like that when I was a kid, and I always thought, oh, what's the Clone Wars going to be? Like, I thought it would be like... I thought it was going to be like clone Jedis or something, or Sith, or... That's what I always thought when I was like, I don't know, like 14, 13... Don't worry, Corey. It's coming in episode eight. <laughs> something, something's, something's. Don't say this. it again. Don't say something's coming. No, no we already something. have that Don't episode. You're right. <laughs> There's a missing piece of the puzzle, as there should be. Anyway, so, uh, moving on along here. Let's. We got to keep speeding here, guys. Which we're not doing. We're not speeding at all. But. Um... <laughs> So Kathleen Kennedy in the interview basically all but confirmed that there's no opening crawl for Rogue One, which I don't think surprises many people. I'm sure there, I'm sure there's some Reddit thread out there or uh, some some forum out there that is spewing rage that how dare they? But uh, that, that's it. We are not. We're we're gonna just bite the bullet and go forward here. There's there's no opening crawl, and that that was confirmed by making Star Wars this week because. Uh, at a fan event in Mexico uh, where Diego Luna showed up, they actually showed the fans 20 minutes of the movie, the first 20 minutes, uh, but no opening crawl. No, it's interesting. Like yeah. what, what I took out of it, and even when she was saying it, she says, we, like, obviously, we've talked about it in the past. We, we, know they pr- we knew they probably weren't going to go this route. <laughs> and but she's still saying that not necessarily, like, leaving that window open, but obviously they're not doing it. But I think what they're looking to do is set the standalones to have their own tradition so that, like, when you see a standalone movie, oh, you know, okay, this is a standalone movie. It's not part of the saga. Yeah. They, I mean, yeah, they have to do something, right? They have to do something to to set them apart. I mean, I, I, oh, guys, holy moly. i got to put this on pause here. It's It's midnight. <laughs> It's time. Oh. Get there. Get there. Go, go, go. Go, go, go. Do, 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 do. Well, so I'm at, I'm at cineplex.com okay. right now. It says tickets on sale Monday. It is Kyle, now stop Monday. Talking. And You're there's busy. no buy tickets thing. So false alarm for the moment. Maybe wow. they just haven't updated their stuff yet. 
It's only 11.59 on my phone, so stay tuned. Okay, Corey, let's talk about um, something so that we can just let Kyle do his thing because we absolutely need to get tickets in the second section. Right, Kyle? <laughs> we didn't talk about this earlier. Are, do you like to sit so close? Where do you like, I to, like sit? to sit? about two-thirds up. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. Okay, perfect. That's what you're working on. Well, Corey and I discuss um, which poll we're going to put first. Are we going to do the gross? Are we going to do um, what people think Rogue One will gross? And we'll do like brackets of 10 million. So like 100 million to 110, 110 to 120, 120 to 130. You're talking about the first week, right? 130 plus? Yeah, like this week? Or this week, are we going to do, well, what's the other option? Yeah, I don't really have another option at the moment. I think I think we're going to have to okay, run so with that one. But you're talking about like gr- okay, so if we're gonna gross run that for the one, week, right? That's what we agree Well, on. like today, gross for the week, yeah, opening weekend. weekend. Yeah, so Thursday to whatever it is. I think they're forecasting 130. I know Fantastic Beasts did 75. That's pretty strong. Um, so to give people perspective. November was a, 75 November was, was a strong month for movies. It was strong, but they were disappointed with that. There was a lot going on in November. Yeah. It's crazy. Did you see here's something here's something we can side talk about real quick. Did you see uh the email I sent you about the forecast cost for Cameron's Avatar movies? You know what? I did see the I didn't catch I didn't read the article. No, I didn't. A, a billion? billion? Wow. A billion. One for billion. how many for for what? Three yeah, movies? Yeah, you're right. If I was doing sound effects, I'd put Austin Powers in here right now. I don't know if that's two or three I think that he's, he's doing filming four at once. total, so but it'd I'm, probably be three back to back. That's still that's a lot. crazy. I know right now the most expensive movie ever made was uh, Pirates of the Caribbean at four hundred million. But geez, Louise, to invest a billion dollars in a project without releasing a movie that takes some serious faith by investors. What's our status, Kyle? Uh, somebody says asleep at the switch. At cineplex.com. So we're waiting? God so there, damn it. There, there's nothing to go? <laughs> yeah, there is, uh, there's no option to buy tickets yet. So that was a big, fat, false alarm. Kind of what I somewhat expected because, uh, like all things with Star Wars, they just don't have their act together. <sighs> this doesn't make sense to me. The Hobbit movie had better advertising for ticket date and execution they went on sale at midnight i bought my tickets what's up with this a little tweet off here at cineplex and say what are you people doing yes we're trying to record a podcast here letters w t f let's see let's see if anybody else is chirping at them right now (laughs) they sure are of course they are what's going on yeah there's a string of tweets here from angry people. <laughs> we waited up. We live. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Fail. So typical. Anyway, let's, let's give him a little tweet. Keep, keep talking guys. Okay. So here, here's a question for you, Corey. If you could give, um, direction duties and I guess writing duties, uh, who, to, to the original trilogy, is there a director alive you would trust with that responsibility to recut, reshoot, redo, reboot? Star Wars? You can't pick Lucas. No, yeah, Star Wars. I wouldn't change it. Okay, let me rephrase the question. You have to pick somebody <laughs> to reboot it. It's going to happen. They're doing it. And you're in charge of picking the writer-director. Hmm. It's 2050... Disney's like, okay, everybody's died who loved the original, 2080, whatever the year is. We're rebooting it. We're we're doing Star Wars Episode One: A New Hope. Someone's getting cast as Luke Skywalker, Han Solo. Who gets to to rewrite and direct that story? I know it doesn't work because it's not 2080 now, and the director will be dead. But I'm I'm saying maybe uh maybe Ron Howard. That's a good call. Ooh, he likes to take a. That he is a good call. Project, he's yeah. responsible. Yeah, and he's... Deep yeah. cuts. I like that. 
Ron Howard. <laughs> would you take him over Spielberg? Because I thought you would go Spielberg, frankly. At uh, this stage of their careers, I think I, I would be awfully tempted to go Ron Howard over Spielberg at this stage. Ten years ago? Maybe even ten years ago. I think I'd have to go back maybe to the 90s before I would, I would in, a, in a heartbeat, say Steven Spielberg. Pre-AI or what did it for you? Like what? Uh, not that I'm turned off Spielberg. Um, I, I just I, I really like Ron Howard's work. Yeah, I can't argue you that. Guys, give me two minutes, man. I gotta let the dog out. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Cineplex has uh, forsaken us here, and I added 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 to the litany of angry tweets sent at them, and also. Uh, Fandango, for our U.S. listeners, is also crapped out. <laughs> this is all going perfectly to plan. So we're, anyway, where were we in the show? We'll continue without Corey here for a, a short bit. I think we were talking Boba Fett. I, no, we, we were done with Boba Fett. We were talking about the crawl. We were. Oh, well, the fact that we have no crawl. I think I was going to say, and this is not my idea. I picked this up off of a listener question to talk Star Wars. Can't remember who sent it in. Um, maybe Connor. I don't think it was him. I just wanted to shout out his name. But uh, I think it'll be a voiceover. And I, I, I think the suggestion made by the listener was, uh, well, can you guess? who Of all the people that could voice over an intro to Rogue One, who might do it? I have no guess. Really? To me, uh, you know what? I, I didn't necessarily have the uh, the answer either. You know, it, hindsight's twenty twenty and all, but it seems obvious to me who it would be. Morgan Freeman's not in this movie, so it <laughs> well, it, that, that, he's it like the, the default Morgan voice Freeman. over guy now, right? Uh, I would but, say was that so. your answer? The premiere? No, it's it's not. I, I'm just hoping you're going to come to it before I do. Forrest Whitaker, man. Yeah, that would be. Yeah, that, he would be. He's got the perfect the perfect voice to intro to do like a, a narration intro. Yeah, well, not that I I didn't read all the details once uh, making Star Wars posted um, sort of the breakdown of that event in Mexico, but I didn't see anything about narration oh and we probably would have huh what's going on brothers yeah that's true uh Back. yeah we're just wrapping up here with the the lack of opening crawl so uh that's that's the way it's going to be now what about tickets we got tickets yet no we don't have tickets they're just they're just not available yet oh wait there it is get tickets here we go <gasps> yeah. boys Really? Oh, the tweets Ser paid off. Are you serious? Come on. Do I am it. absolutely serious. Do Here it. we go. Oh! Do it. <laughs> it's on. Dude, that's awesome. We just used a force there. <laughs> Corey, what did you do? You did not let out the dogs. What did you do? What kind of ritual? I did let out the dog. Trigger, Trigger is the fourth member of the Tumbling Sabres. I'm telling you, this dog. Oh, my God. This dog's the best. Is he the fourth member, or is he the force member? Who knows? This dog is magical, I'm telling you. Oh, for any aspiring podcasters out there, one, two, three, force. Come on, how's that not a podcast? Seriously. Hmm. That is a good one. Go, Kyle. What are you doing? Don't talk yeah. to us. Focus. <laughs> Kyle, you definitely have to get the most expensive tickets because I'm not paying. Seriously, <laughs> we don't. Are we gonna have to see it in 3D? Probably, eh? Well, it depends. Oh uh, no! It, it, I, I, no. If I can get regular 2D, I will get. But last year for Force Awakens, they shoehorned you into their their like premium. Okay, this is not working. I'm online too right now, actually. <laughs> yeah, this is. It says buy tickets, but it doesn't. Um... I, I I have a feeling the the system is not fully ready to go yet. They're booting it up right now because of the tweet. Someone someone's on duty. They're like, oh crap! I'm gonna get fired because yeah, I'm on. They're about to get shift. bombarded. 
Okay, let's 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 keep going on with the show here. We got we got a show to run here. Tickets, come on. Don't worry, my don't worry, my buddy Kyle does the editing and he doesn't <laughs> mind cutting all this stuff out. Uh, so continuing on with uh, the Entertainment Weekly stuff, uh, I think it was Wednesday or Thursday last week. Uh, Bresnikin released his piece about uh, an interview with Michael Giacchino, and it was an awesome, lengthy interview. Uh, but the, the, really, the good stuff that we'll talk about was really in the last quarter uh, where he said that 95% of what he wrote in a really short time, like really just a matter of, of like four <laughs> weeks is original and 5% is stuff that we'll recognize. <clears throat> yeah. It's incredible. Uh, so, yeah. That's exciting to me. All new star Wars stuff. I, I, I wondered given the, the time constraints that this guy would have, would he just sort of lean on what's there? You know, we just lean on what previously exists and and just sort of give different takes on that stuff. Or would he go all original? And it seems like he's gone mostly all original. So Bresnikin asked him, are are we going to hear an Imperial March? His response was maybe, which is to me a yes. Yeah. But he, he said straight up, like, he's been writing this since he's 10 years old. Or someone told him this so to, to tell him to take the job. Like, he was planning on taking a vacation right prior to this. You know how much money they had to have waved in his face? Like, okay, you got about four weeks to write a... Compose a, a, a score for Star Wars. Like, that's... That's a feat. Like, this guy was... I, we, I remember talking about this back when we had heard the news... And I remember totally questioning, like, doesn't this seem, like, really, like, tight on the scheduling? And he spelled it out in the sense where he said, yeah, it's mind-bending. But I guess when you're inspired by something, like, he... I'm really anxious to hear it, too. I think you're absolutely right, though, Corey, in both senses. Um, You you said that they had to throw a lot of money at him. I think you're right. And I... think you're right when you say he's been writing it since he's 10 you, they had to th- find the right guy to throw a lot of money at it's not you know it's not just because you offer up a ton of cash that you can get this pulled off in that amount of time it has to be someone who's passionate and sounds like they you know yeah, they for sure they, they, you know now he's directing or uh, he's composing spider-man as well are the are the two connected somehow you know, I scratch my, you scratch our back, we scratch yours. You know what? This guy was part of the interview was was sort of his most of the interview, in fact, was sort of his story of of where he started and how he's gotten to this point in his career, and it's really a, a crazy ride he's been on. But he's the guy behind the soundtrack, the score in the Call of Duty. I'm uh, sorry, not Call of Duty, uh, Medal of Honor games. I don't know if you guys played those games, but holy hell, I remember playing that game on, I think it was my one of, my, one of the first games I ever played on PS3. And I was just so struck by the score. So struck by the score. And I, I of course, didn't pay any attention to who wrote it. And then suddenly, this week, people start talking about how Michael Giacchino did that score. And it all started making sense. Like, is that sort of what we're going to hear? And and Bresnikin asked asked him that question: Is will we hear uh, hints of what you did in Medal of Honor in Rogue One? And he didn't he didn't outright say, "Yeah, I, I just took that stuff and applied it to Star Wars." But it's going to be in that vein, which is really cool because I remember that the score being among the the great highlights of that of that game. Yeah, it's awesome. I'm I'm really glad that. The, he landed this like who else could take on like such a big responsibility imagine like the pressure he must have felt like you really gotta oh man you can't disappoint with that short of time well yeah you gotta you gotta put your big boy pants on and, and get to work and he did he really did and he, like even the opening theme is different which is I, mentally i think we know it's going to be different. We know there's no opening crawl. It's going to feel different from anything we've ever seen. But I, I, I'm not sure if we can mentally prepare ourselves for that until we actually see it. Well, that's that's touching back on something 
Kathleen Kennedy had said earlier, like I do hope that they they have some kind of iconic like a uh, intro, something that's going to flow throughout the standalones. Something that will recognize like tie them together, will recognize it as that its own thing, you know, its own staple. I have a feeling they're going to morph depending on the 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 feel of the movie, what what type of movie it is. True, but you can morph and I know what you mean. But you could still, you know, kind of tie that into like some kind of common theme. Absolutely. Okay, so let's let's move on to the next thing. So we're done with EU and a, a big tip of the hat to Anthony Bresnik and for all the work he's put in. Uh, support. I guess you could support his work by picking up a copy of EW. I know I'm as soon as I hit see a newsstand, I'm going to grab at least a copy. It's the best way to support his work. Corey, you want to talk about Rebels? Yeah, let's do it for a bit. The win Kathy job. Not, not the, 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 I mean, of all the light episodes that this show has ever given us, this is, might be the lightest. So we're not going to take too long here with, with Rebels before we break into some listener questions here. Perfect. Send me a text when uh, cool. I can come back on. And Hondo, Hondo, Hondo. Damn, got to get caught up because I love uh, Hondo. This, yeah. Okay, peace. If, if you like Hondo, you'll love this. Okay, so the Wincathu job, Corey. Really, not a lot here to chew on, except a, a good number of laughs provided by Hondo Onaka. Yeah. Yeah, the episode started off pretty good like that. In, uh, he made two or three jokes about cannons, eyesight by accident. <laughs> Were they by accident? <laughs> <laughs> Who knows, my friend? It was yeah, they were really fun. I like the way they revealed Hondo. Like it was like this this pan up shot, like ta da! I love that they pulled that. Like it was his intro was just fantastic. They, and they, they, I mean, the joke is in now. It's whenever Hondo shows up, you you know that you're gonna get a few laughs. It's it's kind of always been that way, but he's becoming more of a scene stealer. Every time he shows up, like he was, he was he, hilarious in this episode. Oh yeah, hilarious! But all, at the same time, he's he's got a role to play. Like him and Ezra have a relationship, quite an intimate relationship. And Ezra's the one that keeps getting into jobs and missions with him because Ezra believes in him. And it, that was one recurring theme throughout the episode: is that you know, Kanan basically tells Hera like Ezra has to figure this out for himself. That Basically, Hondo uses Ezra, but Ezra believes in Hondo. Like, he believes in his heart of hearts that Hondo's a good person, kind of, you know what I mean? And Hondo's yep. slowly realizing that for himself as well. Like, Ezra was super disappointed in Hondo at one point in, in this episode. And also, like, we finally got our Zeb episode. Zeb was in uh, command. Yeah, finally. Again, shows... It was a little more further character development into Ezra. Like, he's still a bit of a young punk. He can't take orders. Uh, Like, Zeb gives him a few direct orders, which he disobeys, which, you know, bite them in the butt. Yeah, it definitely did bite bite them in the butt. Yeah, I mean, Ezra certainly has issues taking orders from somebody who he sees probably beneath him at this point. He can take orders from Hera and and Sato and, and... probably Kanan, but he's definitely got issues with people who he sees as on the level with him. Yeah, him him and Zeb have always had like a brotherly relation as well. But I think, you know, it was Ezra's job, right? Like Ezra got the information from Hondo, set the whole deal up, so he figured he'd be in command. And well, yeah, he feels point... a, he feels a certain ownership. Yeah, but Harris' whole point was you know, Hondo's here, so no, you can't be in control because Hondo kind of manipulates you a bit. But it was good. Like, they, they come to a, a mutual understanding, I think, uh, Zeb and Ezra. And even Hondo kind of realizes is the error of his ways. I could see Hondo meeting his end in this series, too, and sadly, like, saving Ezra or something. <laughs> you love making everybody sacrifice themselves. Yeah. Just not Chopper. I think Chopper had the, the funniest thing in this episode, though. At the end, 
when you know the ghost is attached to the cargo ship and it's going down and you know it's right at the dire last seconds and chopper just like takes off and he's like woo, 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 woo. And ezra's like what every man for himself <laughs> yeah that, that was funny me. yeah that was a good one but yeah other than that not too much it's just i've at least zeb got a bit of time in the spotlight you know de- develop their relationship a little further again Ezra is still not ready to really fully commit. He's still hot-headed. Um, okay, so I mean, like, zipping through a couple points here. Uh, we talked about the bl- the blind jokes, which were tasteless but funny. And um, they again this week, the captured effect. Maybe really? not as pronounced. Yeah. No. Uh, Zeb and as Morgan in in those cells. You know who does as Morgan's voice, eh? Uh, the name is on my tongue. I don't have his name handy either, but <laughs> he's actually quite old now. He got, he's in a couple of Seinfeld episodes. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, Wong? Is it James Wong? Something like that. Uh, I can't remember. I'm surprised they actually brought him back, but... Yeah, I don't, I don't like that character. Nah. As Morgan sucks. But it, that was funny. He he had a funny line though, when he when he mentions the, the, the time that Hera decked him with a tray, uh, and, and so again the streak of of people being captured continues. That's uh, what seven episodes in a row now, and still no consequence paid. Ay ay ay, uh, and again like like last week they gave some characters um, names fr- from their staff. So the, the little Ugnaught named Melch is obviously in in homage to Stephen Melching, who is, I, I believe, one of the editors <clears throat> in Rebels. So I mean, the last point I want to talk about is the sentry droids. We saw these in the trailers after a Star Wars celebration in, in London, and we all freaked out. Oh my god, it looks like the, the, the dark troopers from whichever video game it was that they were part of, and could it be those guys? Yeah, it turns out they're just a bunch of sentry droids that, to me, look like nothing more than a slightly updated version than uh, from from a super battle droid. Yeah, that and I find their faces kind of look like a early concept art for Vader almost. Yeah, yeah, it had like that that grill, <clears throat> that like that the triangular mouthpiece for Vader. And they were, I, I thought they would be tougher. I mean, I know that they took a few shots and they get back up and keep on ticking. But again, week after week, they, they keep stumbling into trouble and the bad guys have the worst aim ever. Even AP5, though, he's a bit of a bobo. Like, he's like, I told you not to do that. Well, why didn't you maybe... tell us why? Exactly. If it's that important, you know, like. And usually droids don't omit those types of things. It's it's part of their their programming. Just for a droid forgetting seems kind of weird. What up, boys? Yo 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 yo. So yo. yeah, we are we're just about done with rebels. Uh, it was it was really a funny episode that I I take very little out of. And I I don't even see how this episode plays into future episodes. If if they're kind of dropping breadcrumbs here, I don't see them. All right, so let's, I guess, move on from Rebels. That was probably the quickest we've ever touched on Rebels. And uh, we'll hope for for more substantial stuff next week from the Inside, was it Inside Man? Uh, Yeah, I haven't seen that, to be honest. All right, then. So let's uh, now it's time to head over. Actually, you know what? Let's let's backtrack, and we'll talk about the IMAX posters. <whistles> yeah, yeah. <laughs> the Vader one is the Vader one is particular. The Vader one is my favorite. It's and probably because I've already become attached to that image of the of the ATATs in the water. Um, I, I don't know. There's something about that Vader poster. I said last week. I think that they they overuse Vader in posters. But it's my favorite of these three. It's perfect because you get Vader in there and his helmet kind of incorporates the Death Star and the colors. Death Star, yeah. 
I like the the the, f- the dark to the light blue, and then right where the ATATs are, you got the horizon. So it's got all the colors in there. You know what I mean? It looks mm, looks really nice. Yeah, it's it's super sharp. I love it. <clears throat> the one with Jin in the background, I like a lot too. Yeah, I like the way it's all positioned. I like the colors of that poster, but there's there's something about the um. I find they've done a poor job of making Jin look, of capturing great Jin faces. I don't know. Maybe it's just me. Even this one, she looks frowny, pouty instead of yeah. despondent. <laughs> it almost reminds me of an '80s poster, though. Just because, like, look at K two uh, SO on it. You know, like just just that alone. Like it almost from rem- it's a throwback to something for me. <laughs> It's a throwback to something. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Eloquent as always. Ah, dude. I don't know. Just, I like that one. That's definitely my second favorite as well. Okay, so let's uh, let's wrap that up. That, that's sort of the news portion of the show. Our Rebels wrap-up is done. And now we're going to hear from our good pal, Ads. He's got, a, he's got another couple... Jesus Christ. I'm losing my, losing my ability to speak here as I multitask on Cineplex.com who still don't have their, their act together. Jesus. And they're, they're, this is very disappointing. Very disappointing. Oh, yeah. it so is. They're, they're still getting hammered on Twitter. And they keep saying, oh, check back momentarily. You idiots. We've got to ca- we got to capture this live. Live, yo. Well, uh, how long of a show do you want to put out? And how late do you want to stay up? Ask Cineplex. <laughs> as long Not as me. it takes. No, Corey, you cannot bail. If you bail, you don't get a ticket. I'm not bailing. Ooh. I'm not Even if away. he's buying. I no ain't stupid Coleman. Cineplex. <laughs> okay, so up next is Ads. Let's hear what he has to say. Good evening, boys. So another week, another episode in the can, and uh, a little bit closer to Rogue One. And with that in mind, I look forward to hearing how the bet's going. All I'll say is, having started to read Catalyst myself, it's quite a big book, Corey, to be fair. Anyhow, I'm sure you've got it under control. So, uh, my additions this week. Again, a couple of questions. The first one is a bit more simple. So, controversially, if, and I don't think they ever will be but if the prequels were ever remade and you were able to actually have a say in how they were remade would you change the story or would you just change how they looked i.e the visuals so that's the first question the second one probably is a bit more in depth uh, and relates to snoke do you think that snoke's backstory could be influenced somewhat by the Mortis arc in the Clone Wars involving the father, the son and the daughter. I think you've touched on it previously. Um, They're described as a powerful family of force wielders known as the Ones and uh, Mortis itself is an ancient monolith of unknown origin and supposedly the flow of the force is especially strong there. Mortis may actually be the very origin of the force itself apparently. Uh, The father, the son and the daughter all died in the Clone Wars arc. But I wonder whether, and your thoughts on this, could Snoke be either another of the ones, which we don't know about yet, or even maybe the son himself somehow survived a la Maul, etc.? So I look forward to hearing you kick that around for a bit, uh, and I'll be uh, yeah really interested to hear what you think. And then finally, I just wanted to say that um, I think the Sif Disturbers is an absolutely brilliant addition to uh, my week's podcast listening, especially as it gives uh, Corey a platform to vent his frustration regarding the uh, poll results. So keep up the great work. Long live the Commonwealth, and I'll catch you next week. Bye. And there goes Ads, the venerable knight of the Star Wars Commonwealth. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your compliments. 
on Sith Disturbers. We are having an absolute blast with that uh, looser formatted show, I think. And, and James is having a, a great time putting in the sound effects and, and doing the post on that show. Um, James, you want to chime in there? Like, What's it like cobbling together all, all those effects? It's fun. I'm learning that uh, I'm very, very slow at editing together a show, uh, mostly because of um, like ineptitude. But uh, <laughs> ditto. The le- the learning curve is pretty steep, though. Like once I've done something once, I only have to do it thirty or forty more times before I know how to do it. <laughs> so that's pretty good. It is slow, though, right? Like even when I put together <laughs> this show, it would seem simple. Like we just have a conversation, and I I. You would think that I would just take that conversation and post it to the web, but it's never that simple. Like you, you, there is some editing. There is, uh, and I hope we're doing uh, Cody over at uh, the Rogue Squadron podcast proud. We we, we care about the post. <laughs> we definitely do. So he knows about we, his we, stuff. We, yeah, definitely he does. Uh, so yeah, we, we we try to manage the sound quality. We try and uh, make ourselves sound at least semi coherent. I, I think we do a decent job, but, uh, yeah, there's, it's, it's, there's a big learning curve to it. It's it like James, you've said it a bunch of times. It's not hard, but it's, no. it's, it takes time. Well, it's, 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 that's, that's it. It's really simple. It Everything I do is very, it's very simple. Click, copy, paste, open, drag. Like it's not hard. Uh, putting in the sound effect takes, you know, a, a minute or two, but if you put in 60 sound effects times two minutes, You've just spent two hours, uh, but thanks, Ads. No, we love it, and I'm I'm uh, I'm enjoying the Sith Disturbers because it gets, it gives me a, a chance to sort of to play with those sound effects things. So if you guys are liking that, I will definitely keep doing it. I'm loving it. Let's let's attack those questions, guys. Let's get to it. Okay, so Corey, would you change the story or visuals of the prequels if you had the opportunity? Yeah, I think sadly, like I would like to change a bit of both, like not all that much. Uh, it's a hard question if you have to choose either or because like the visuals kind of bothered me a bit in a way too it wasn't as real like kind of with what I, we think we're going to be getting in like Rogue One or something so that kind of took me out of it and the storyline a bit like the 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 skeleton to the storyline is great I think everyone can kind of agree on that but just the way it was executed was it could be it could be retconned a little Blasphemer! James, Blasphemer! <laughs> um, I won't touch the story at all, but I will reshoot the whole thing. <laughs> I, I know what you mean. I know what you mean. You just, just clean it up and make some things clearer and or execute it differently. Um, yeah, no, I, I really wouldn't change the, the, the telling of the tale in, in the sense uh, you would get all the same information at the end of your three movies. Uh, you know, I wouldn't touch George's vision in that sense. Um, but I definitely would change the way the movie was shot, uh, visually and, uh, the edit. Um, I think I'd, I'd add, I, I could, I could tell that story in two movies and I would take out the middle one and just, I, I would tell, you know, half an hour of the, of the Clone Wars at the end of, uh, the first movie. And I would tell half an hour of Clone Wars at the beginning of the third movie. And I would just probably take the second movie out altogether. Yeah. Yeah. I, well, I think I think I'm kind of in that same ballpark as you guys. Like, I wouldn't change the story at all. Like you said, James. Uh, at least not the major beats. I think Anakin's story, uh, the boy from Tatooine, the slave boy from Tatooine, who rises to greatness uh, under the, you know, the, the the great destiny of being the chosen one. You know, his, his attachment to his mom, to Padme, his destiny, his you know, his his kind nature that slowly devolves into this this selfishness because of those attachment issues. I think that story has a lot of emotional resonance for for everybody, really. You know, Palpatine's rise and fall. Yeah, that's. that's I, I think a big one. the backdrop of that is superb storytelling. It, it, I mean, it's a bit rushed. It's a it's a lot to tell about you know the, the rise, the the fall and decay of society as a backdrop. So it, it I, I understand why some of that got ham fisted. Uh, but yeah, I, the, the resulting story in my prequel world would be the same. It would still be Anakin with his issues. It would still be Anakin falling in love and turning to evil under the sway of Palpatine. It would still be Palpatine rising to to Emperor. I, I might just do it differently. And the one thing I would probably change entirely is is the origin of the clone army. The Sifo-Dyas thing. At the very least, I would change that name. 
Siphodius Sidious. It's just, it's not well thought out. I, hmm. I would clean that part up entirely. But that's that's really the, the one piece of the prequels that I would completely fix. That's if it, true. If it were up to me. That's true. The, as far as visuals go, I would I wouldn't touch. I would I would not really touch them at all. I, I would try to update Attack of the Clones. I think some of that looks painfully CG. Uh, I, I don't know if if cleaning up or updating the visuals. Oh, I'd reshoot it. I'd reshoot it all like they, like they shot uh, the Force Awakens. I I just I find a lot of it looks blue screen, and it's ugh, yeah. Yeah, I, mean, I don't there's, like there's, looking. There's shots you know, like, for example, the shot of uh, the Grand Army of the Republic, sort of on that airfield with the with the fake orange sky. It just it looks cartoony. It it, yeah. it doesn't look real. Uh, whereas the, when you the, look at the, the Force lava Awakens, fight too, I, f- I find the lava fight uh, I, I get taken out of that scene a lot. Yeah, from Revenge of the Sith. Yeah, I I like that one. There, there, you're right though. There are moments where you could tell it's it's awfully green screened or blue i don't know right uh, for the most part it would i wouldn't change the effects i don't i don't know if this is if this is changing ads question but i wouldn't change the effects i would update them i don't know if that's two different things i think that that falls into the realm yeah so hey there we go so i mean for, for all the, the the crap we fling at the at the prequels I, we kind of left them alone yeah, I would never. <laughs> we like, we kind remember, of all agree that it's a great story. Just it, it needs a little bit of help. I, I was I'm totally on the same page as you with the clones, though. I remember you and I growing up, and when we heard about the the prequels were coming, we had like I was young. I was probably like 14 or 15. And we had all this time to build up to it, and then we didn't really know what the clones were or what they were going to be, and kind of you know sneaking the Boba factor into there. Really, you know, they could have played that a lot differently. Like when I was a kid, I thought it would be like. Jedi clones or something a lot deeper than just that. Yeah, I, well, I think that's that becomes an entirely different story, really. Uh, the clones versus the droids. Yeah, I don't know. Whatever. That that's a, that's another story for another day. Uh, part two of Ad's question: So, does Snoke's backstory have any uh, fingerprints of the Mortis arc from the Clone Wars cartoon on it? Cor- Corey, do you think there's any influence there? Do you remember that? When was the last time you saw that arc? It's been a while, to be honest. Like, probably, I'd say, at least a good year. Yeah, it's been it's been several months for me. And I, I always intend to go back to it because that that was just a mind-bender of an arc. Like, I still don't know what I saw. <laughs> like, I, I don't know if what they, what they experienced was, was real. In my mind, what went on... You know, because the Mortis trilogy... Mortis is really this this big metal box floating out in wild space in the Star Wars galaxy. Uh, but inside is this this realm of Mortis, right? So, And what I take from the whole thing is that the three shared a Force vision. Now, I don't know if this, is, this was the Force giving Anakin, Obi-Wan, and Ahsoka a message, or if something actually transpired. I don't know. I don't, I don't know how I'm supposed to interpret that. Um... But anyway, to, to answer Ad's question, I don't I don't think Snoke's backstory has anything to do with or anything directly to do with the Mortis arc. What do you think, Corey? Yeah, I, I kind of agree with you. Um, I think it would be a bit of a stretch to kind of you know pull him into the saga, the brother, and that because it would be it would fall on a lot of deaf ears. A lot of people aren't just aren't that deep into star wars even though there are there's a, like a, it would fly over a lot of people's heads so but i do kind of see it being like a sense you know we, we learned in that episode about you know the light the dark the gray the middle the bendu the ashla the bogan in a way so I, i'm skeptical of snoke so i'm on the same boat as you like i, I don't know if they're directly related but there's something that you could connect them to because again like i don't, we don't know who snoke is and to me he's i don't know if he's really even a force wielder or not you know it's uh yeah i mean that story hasn't ever that that question hasn't officially been answered yet you're right but i think that's where I, the I series that, or the saga is going toward is that uh like you know we've seen it more and more in animation and just the balance factor of the gray you know like something in between 
Yeah, and there's that line from the novelization where uh, Snoke has his eyes on Kylo Ren, Ben, specifically <sighs> because of, of his perfect mix and his blend of light and dark tendencies. So there's that middle reference again. I, I think at the end of the day, all of these stories have commonalities. So when we when we look at Snoke's backstory, whenever we do get around to it, and I assume we'll get to it to a certain point, he may be always one of those guys who his origin, like Yoda, is shrouded in mystery. And maybe we never learn where, he, where exactly he comes from. Uh, if he turns out to be Gallius Rax from uh, Aftermath, then we will get somewhat of a, a specific origin. But if he's not, maybe we never will know. Uh, but again, like all these things might ha- share things in common as far as uh, force entities go. And uh, yeah, but to draw a specific lo- or straight line between the two, I, I don't know that we'll, we'll be doing that anytime soon. No, it's like it was like the beginning of a setup, you know, for further stories. Well, yeah, I, I mean, guess. the Mortis arc was, I think, was supposed to be kind of metaphorical about the whole nature of the force to begin with. Yeah. And, and so it would, I think it would apply to almost any situation where, where, where you're talking about the force. So yeah, indirectly, we, we may be able to, to, to connect some dots between Snoke and uh, the, the Mortis arc. But you know, like Ads, Ads asked if we thought maybe he would be the son who somehow survived. Uh, I, I doubt that very, very much. I, I, again, I don't even think this, I don't even know if the son was real or the daughter or... Or the father. I don't know if any of those things were real or, or if they were just visions. But I'm, I, I, have to, I do have to go back and watch Mortis again. And, yeah, definitely. And maybe we should watch it this, together. Maybe write about it someday. But yeah, we probably should. One of these days. <laughs> well, you got Netflix. Just add it to the list of things we keep talking about doing. Well, I'll have a good would you rather this week for you then. Fair enough. Okay, so uh, lastly, Corey, how, how's the reading going? I, I, Ads, Ads is curious to know how, uh, whether or not you have things well in hand. Things, uh, things are. I mean, I still got a, quite a long road ahead of me. I, I won't lie, but I'm. I would like to think I'm ahead of the game with from from where I began, and you know, I, I got a game plan in hand, and uh, I know Mister O'Flaherty over there is just f- keeps flinging gas on the fire. So, you know, uh, I'm gonna have me some free cal- calamari. I, I promise you that to all the Commonwealth. Why would you go and do that? Why would you go and and, and make a promise that you can't keep? You're just gonna tell oh, it. You're man. just gonna tell everyone that I didn't keep your. You're gonna like buy me off on the side and be like, just keep this fifty bucks, Corey, and don't tell anyone. Um. No. Okay. Let, let's be clear about um the bet. Ideally, <laughs> for me, um, you read this book at some point. That was the point of making the bet. So it's a win-win. If you read this book and I buy calamari, so be it. And I my will tickets. Gladly <laughs> and and tickets. Gladly and honorably uh, pay up and, and own up on air next week, uh, or excuse me, in, in a few weeks. However, um, I, I think even despite your your uh, schemery with ads. By the way, Mister Ads Edition, I know what's going on. Hey, don't blame ads. Uh, with- I, I I threw him, I brought him into it. I I said, can I tell you something, bro? <laughs> He was like, "Sure, man." <laughs> hey, uh, there, there was nothing private about it. I don't know if 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 uh, if everybody realized, but all those messages were going back in a group thread, anyways. But um, all to say that if you lose this bet, Corey, I am going to delight in mocking you for weeks and weeks and weeks. <laughs> the, the, the value of winning far outweighs the negatives of losing. Of so. Course. I love this. I love this bet. <laughs> and by weeks and weeks, that could also mean months and months. Oh, there are many, many weeks in in decades, and that's how long this could last. <laughs> no, I'm fully inspired. <laughs> I'm not too worried. I've been doing pretty good, to be honest. I'm uh, taking. Yeah, notes I've, I've got everything. you pegged at about. Uh, how was I? You saw my message to ads. I said uh, you're probably what 150 pages in. No. Drum roll effect. Fuck. 
lightsaber effect. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> just like love making my life difficult. Sorry, man. You want me to time, t- time stamp that for you? You got that, boss. Oh, man. You know, I'm trying to deal with Cineplex here, and now I've got Corey who just can't keep a lid on it. <laughs> Don't don't st- don't start a podcast, everybody. Just just don't do it. Actually, I know oh. I've said in the past to, to you should definitely do it, but I'm, now I'm saying definitely don't do it. You you know what the bird is? Yes, I know what the bird is, Goose. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, yeah, uh, yeah. Put it this way, one fifty. Eh, that's no. I'm about a third, a third done. I have the hard uh, the hard cover. I think that's all that's available. Really? Eh? Yep. No. Well, audiobook, but yeah, as far, as far as a printed copy, it's it's hardback or nothing. Yeah, I got, I'm on page. 97. I hate that they do that, by the way. I really don't like that move. Oh, you know what? I would I, I would never buy paperbacks, frankly. So I don't I don't mind that move at all. Really? The only paperbacks I own are, are ones people bought for me. Really? Eh? Yeah, love hardcovers. Me too. It depends on the book, though. You know, if it's just something to like toss or I don't know, like. I wouldn't do it for. I'll admit, Corey. There's a good point to travel with. I grab. I, I say all the soft covers I own are, are gifts, but I do enjoy those gifts when I travel. It's nice to have a you know something you can just throw in a suitcase. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I what I don't like about them. I mean, I have plenty of hardcover books. I have many, many leather-bound books. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, oh my! <laughs> but uh, I don't like having the choice made for me. Eh, yeah, and I okay, guess that's fine. why they do it, right? Because they they know I people are probably going to spend eleven ninety nine rather than twenty nine ninety nine. Oh no, for sure. And it's it's almost like forcing people to buy th- you know like three D tickets for a premiere of a movie. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, that, that's another. Well, again, if you're a businessman, you love that move. If if you're not a businessman or you're a paying customer, you're probably ticked. But you're a sucker, so you you do it anyway. I kind of hate 3D too. I can't say I hate it, but uh, yeah, I'm not a big fan either. It takes me, a, it takes, a, I'd say a good couple minutes for my eyes to adjust and stuff. I feel a little weird too. And I, I and love it's unfortunate it in animation. To to sh- yes. But I don't like it in live action. It's unfortunate to have to see a movie for the first time that way. I, I don't mind seeing, you know, whatever, The Hobbit and Star Wars movies in 3D after I've taken them in two or three times the good old fashioned way. But um, yeah, the first time I find that a bit unfortunate. Yeah, I I totally agree. Okay, uh, thank you, ads. Let's let's speed ads, along. Ads, you're the oh, man. You're the man. Ads. Always such good questions and making me do homework. Yeah, and you know what? He's he's running a couple of really good polls lately too. We may we may uh, use some of his poll content for for Sis Disturbers one of these weeks because Seriously. he's run some great stuff. Yeah, the last two we ran were stellar, man. Yep. Are you saying we're just going to co-opt co-opt ads as like his his Twitter polls? We're just going to grab them and use them as our own? We're going to steal his intellectual property and without telling him use his material and sit the servers. Yeah. Dude, he's saying. a lawyer. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sue me. <laughs> <laughs> well, if, then for the rest of your life, James, you could say that you're involved in an international scandal. Absolutely. And we've made um, exactly zero pennies off this whole deal so far. So if he wants uh, half of them, you, you, can have, you can have at least that. Scandalous. Yeah, zero, zero pennies. I know. We're, we're, still, we're, we're being shut out here. <laughs> if somebody just wants to scratch us a check and, and, and send it to us, that would be awesome. Ads. <laughs> <laughs> like, like he doesn't do enough for us already. <laughs> oh, jeez. Okay, so I got to backtrack to last week's question from Carlos, who asked us, he had a gripe about the, the retconning of the Obi-Wan and Emperor scene, uh, where, where the Emperor tells Vader that we have a new enemy. And he didn't have a problem with the updated visuals. Of course, that, that's self-explanatory, how that needed to be done. But the text itself. So we're not going to replay that there, but we, we went through the question here. And then, of, of course, with the great support of the Commonwealth community, Rob at Talk Star Wars chimed in over Twitter and presented us with a very obvious option. No, what that he did we- was he said, uh, hey, dummies. <laughs> he could have just been way more simple in what, it, in, in what he meant when he said, Obi-Wan's not around anymore because I killed him. 
Yeah. Like we, you had a good yeah. point. <laughs> it's a great point. Like it, it's, it's not exactly like we were like, Oh, well, I guess that's a big flub up, but no, it, it's, it's just, it's so simple that we completely missed it. Like we're always trying to overcomplicate things, but it, it's really that simple that Vader was just saying, you know, I killed Obi-Wan. So he's not an option for Luke. He never, there's no, it's not clear at all whether or not uh, Vader knows that you know, uh, uh, Luke spent any time with Kenobi. And it's not necessary for him to know that, for him to say that. Exactly. I'll still, I'm still going to go ahead and say it. there's a flub up in the writing and Rob just covered the his butt big time. No, Rob saved our butt big time. He saved, no, it's a great point. And I'm really like, again, I'm surprised none of us brought it up, but. I'm saying in, in the writing too, like I don't think it's meant to be construed that way, but it can be construed that way. And Rob just pointed that out. Well, maybe we just, again, maybe we just missed it. Rob got it. No, you're right. So maybe maybe we, it went maybe over we, our heads, and but Rob's like six eight. <laughs> <laughs> he can get those high ones that we can't grab. Nothing goes over my head. I would catch it. <laughs> Hey, Drax is on the show, everybody. <laughs> All right, so thank you, Rob and Carlos. You, you get a double dip on your question without, without even asking. How about them apples? I hope we're having apples and other food with Carlos in a couple of weeks, buddy. Let us know. <laughs> he hasn't even heard the podcast yet, and we're already badgering him for an answer. <laughs> it, it feels like we, we, we started recording this like so long ago that we should have an answer by now. Seriously. That yeah, I know. What's going on with those tickets? Don't ask again. Or I'm gonna buy five. <laughs> oh, dude. <laughs> you mean I'm gonna buy five? Corey's pretty there's, convinced. There's gonna be one less, is what I'm saying. Well, I was, I was maybe kinda... James, maybe you you may not have to buy one at all. That's what I was saying. Corey, if, if, yeah. if I Corey, if I ban you from the show and you lose the bet, you're still buying James's ticket. Well, that's what I was kind of think, about to think, you know, like we we're talking about m- monetary things before. I love it. And I was kind of like, why are James and I even paying for anything? Like this should be like a, a the director of Tumbling Saber is taking his uh, his boys out for a nice Christmas special. Because I put all my money into Tumbling Saber just to keep the lights on. <laughs> He's the only one who pays anything. <laughs> <laughs> that's not true, Corey. You and I invest our time and our intellectual property. Indeed, we do. We burn That's the midnight worth oil. Something. That's true. I, I hurt most Mondays pretty badly. Um, well, Monday's painful enough as it is, so you know, you might as well just take a double helping of pain. <laughs> yeah, see, I. <laughs> That's sound. Reasoning. I guess uh, when I get to your guys' age, you, uh, I'll let you know. But I'm good on Mondays. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And we we have a, a first a question from. Paul Corey, who is otherwise known as Paul Coruscant on the, on the Talk Star Wars. Great Really nice name. to hear from him. I was actually very Great surprised. Name. So he asks, Hey guys, I wanted to send this over to you to see if you wanted to discuss. I've already asked it to the lads at Talk Star Wars, but wanted to get your input. We know now that the Kyber Crystal chooses the Jedi, and then the color is designated due to the Jedi's temperament, good, evil, etc. Do you think it would be cool... If Kylo Ren is redeemed, his sputtering saber term turns from red to either blue or green. Maybe it starts with the sparks that come off his lightsaber. They turn green first. Then you see tendrils of green running through the main blade until it totally engulfs the red. Do you think that is plausible? Do you guys Also, do you guys think that it would be cool to see? It would be a massive visual indicator that he is changing to the light and then the other way around for Rey. Keep up the great work. Love the pod. And we love you, pod. Or Paul. Uh, James, you want to kick this one off? How do you how do you feel about that? We 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 talked about the whole lightsaber thing, the kyber crystals, how they the unfolding nature that we're that we're learning about here. Okay, so I've got a couple of different ways to to answer this question. But uh hey Paul, how's it going? Thanks a lot for your question. Hope it's the first of many. Um and <laughs> wait, my wait. answer yeah, my answer is um, yes and no. Uh, yes, first of all, to, to the point of do I want to see that or do I or do I think it would look cool? Absolutely. I think that that is an amazing visual. I'm not 100% sure if I'd rather see it animated, maybe in Rebels, th- that kind of move, 
or if I want to see it in live action, it might it might hold up better uh, animated, I think. But it, it could be really cool live action as well for sure. Um, but my my negatives against it or my questions uh, as to whether or not they could do that or will do that would be to the effect of, um, from what I understood, the red color comes from when the lightsaber is bleeding and bent and broken to the will of, of the Sith um, master, lord, whatever. So can it be healed when, when, the, when the Jedi is redeemed? I'm not sure. You know, I'm not sure like the technicalities of that. Kyle or Corey, do you know? No. That, that... Uh, I have some input on that. It depends on if Corey wants to hear it. Um, you know what? I, I was going to just about to say the same thing as James, like word for word almost. Like we've not heard about healing crystals. We heard about bleeding crystals. But yeah, I, I'm good. Whatever. Go for it, man. Okay. So so based on the Ahsoka novel, uh, dark side users take a Jedi's crystal. So whether they kill a Jedi themselves or a Jedi and take the crystal from their saber or they find one. However, they, they like James said, they bleed the crystal, which is bending the the crystal to their will which turns it red so in the ahsoka novel that's true um, and i remember this it it's clear that like at least to me that they, they kind of illustrated it as a process like it, it doesn't happen like just like that it, it takes the dark side user some time to break the crystal's will if you will um and i mean the I don't, I don't understand this whole kyber, kyber crystal thing. The more we learn at this point, the more confused I get. Cause for no, sure, can I? I'm going to confuse you even more. Sure. Why is Why is Vader's saber red? That was already his crystal. Well, he leave when he battles Obi Wan on, on Mustafar. That saber, like Obi Wan, takes that saber. It's it's Ray's saber, right? So Vader has to get another one. And I don't know if we've if, if there's another story out there, a canon story that tells us where Vader got his red crystal from, uh, mm, but he, no, he right. made a new yeah. saber. That's true. Thanks for pointing that out. Okay, that, I guess I guess that that makes a lot more sense. Yeah, maybe we learn about that someday. Uh, I mean, yeah, there's there's still so much to sift through and learn because like in in Rebels, in Clone Wars, when when the Padawans and including Ezra, when they get their crystals for the first time. To me, they already look colored. They already look blue or green. Yeah, Whereas that's in the Ahsoka true. novel, they're they're clearly I'm written re- in such a way that you think the Kyber Crystal is invisible to the eye until the Jedi hears the Kyber Crystal's song calling to it. And the song was a new addition. And I don't know if that's specific to Ahsoka or if every Jedi hears the, the Crystal's song. No, uh, that's even referenced in that... Uh, I watched that episode... At least twenty times with my son, he loved that episode, and each one kind of like you can hear it has like a beckon to each specific. They hear something, they kind of see something that other people can't see either, which was interesting. Okay, so uh, yeah, that that sounds familiar, I suppose. So let's let's just say that that part was kept consistent. The color of the crystal to me is has not been kept consistent. Like they, they, the Padawans receive them colored. I would like to keep that trend too. Kind of like, I don't want to see them be like mood rings, you know? Well, right. But that's what I'm saying. I think what we're going to see, and I, from the trailers in rogue one, that, that crystal, that, that Jin has around her neck. I think that's a natural quote unquote, invisible Kyber crystal. Hmm. I think that's the natural state of the Kyber crystal. And then going back to the Ahsoka oh, yeah, novel, yeah. once she, or Corey, here's the spoiler, or for anybody else who hasn't read Ahsoka I know yet. what you're going to say. <clears throat> so she she battles an Inquisitor, and he's got a lightsaber and she doesn't, but she's Ahsoka and he's not, so she's going to kick his ass anyway. And she does, and this guy dies. And when, she's, when she grabs, when she keeps the crystals for herself, when she ignites the blades once again, when she's built her own handles, they're white. So they, the, the, earlier in the book, they talked about the process of, of breaking it, and then it seems like it, they can be healed. And it seems like Ahsoka did that pretty quickly to hers. Unless the crystal does it itself, once it knows that the, the, the dark side user that broke its will is dead, so it can just 
relax and go back to its natural state. There's, there's still so much to learn. But to answer Paul's question, I, I don't know. I, I guess you, I could see it happening. It would make a cool visual, that's for sure. It look, it would look amazing. Yeah, yeah. You know, S- S- Snoke is is ready to kill Leia, and Kylo is just standing by his side. It's sort of an inverse scene from Return of the Jedi. And then you, you, Kylo Ren is just standing by, w- waiting for Snoke to kill his mother. And then you could see the look on Kylo's face. And Adam Driver is really good at conveying emotion with his face. He did a, a stunning job with that in The Force Awakens. But then you, you would see the look on his face change and you could feel that maybe he's having a change of heart. And then, yeah, maybe you could imagine his lightsaber right there on the spot turn from red to green or blue. Behind without Which Snoke w- seeing. It's it's almost like they're telling all these Kybo they're letting out all this kyber crystal information building towards that scene because we need to know why it's changing right yeah that's yeah that's a great point that's a great point and i i still maintain that that kyber crystals you know as as a plot device as as you know semi-sentient things as they appear to be i think they're the new midi chlorian yeah Yeah, we said that before i stand behind it i think it's very risky to go and and try to to put labels and numbers on why lightsabers are cool and colorful. Yeah. So, I mean, I think, I think this might get more confusing before it gets clear again. Yeah. Cause you can even look at it in but the I, sense that like, okay, Ahsoka healed the crystals, but you know, if another Jedi went out there and healed the crystal, like who knows, maybe it would be green or something, but Ahsoka's no Jedi anymore, you know? Yeah. And it, I mean, it, 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 it plays to on so many things right there's that that same i think that same episode Corey, that you were talking about from rebels where the inquisitors access the temple but you see it, it like all those those channels of light are red like they it almost seems like they they make the jedi temple bleed that's true too so i i think this this swings more than one way But I think that's a great question. I, I think, Paul, I think we're going to revisit this uh, probably more than once over the next uh, I don't, I, at least a couple of years before this is, I guess, uh, household knowledge, so to speak. But thank you for the question, sir. Follow, follow Paul at pcory150 on Twitter. I think that's his Twitter handle. It would have helped if I looked this up beforehand. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's at pcory150. Oh, pcory150? Yeah, double R. With C O R R Y. That's that's important, the double R. All right, chaps, we we've done it. I mean, we we finished the show. We we don't have our tickets yet, Cineplex. Thank you very much for failing. <laughs> Boo. <laughs> Boo. Reason, man. What a joke. <laughs> and uh yeah, I guess we'll have more to tell on this, but this this is I'm not surprised. I mentioned it before. I'm not, I'm not surprised how this went sideways. What a joke. We're going to have to joke. rant about this on Sith Disturbers and, and bring up the lightsaber to cut Corey's F-bombs. <laughs> we better get tickets. Yeah, we're gonna, we might need multiple lightsabers. Okay, everybody. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, don't forget to check out the other great shows of the Star Wars Commonwealth, Talk Star Wars, who, who will, this week will be uh, celebrating their 50th episode. How time flies. I remember you know, earlier this year just you know, listening to episode 7, episode 8, when they, when they had uh, Anna Maria Leonte on. And all of us were just still getting our, our feet wet. Uh, definitely, I'm sure they're going to have a killer, killer, epic 50th podcast. So check that out. And, and make sure you follow uh, Generation X-Wing as well, the Rogue Squadron podcast. And new to the lineup is the Skyhoppers podcast. Uh, make sure you, you check out Star Wars Commonwealth on the web. And on iTunes, you can. That, that's probably the easiest way to, to find us. Just check out uh, Star Wars Commonwealth on iTunes, and you'll get access to to all the shows. And uh, as for us, I'm I'm at Tumbling Saber on Twitter. Corey, where can we find you? That's at Chop Rules with a Z. Beautiful. And James, Tommy Bombadil One. Excelente. All right, guys. Uh, we'll see you guys this week again in Sith Disturbers number six. Until then, enjoy uh, your the rest of your working week and we'll talk soon. Self-redeeming
Just don't 